The epistle for this Mass of Our Lady on Saturdays is taken from Ecclesiastes chapter 24. From the beginning and before the world was I created, and unto the world to come I shall not cease to be. And in the holy dwelling place I have ministered before him. And so was I established in Sion, and in the holy city likewise I rested, and my power was in Jerusalem. And I took root in an honorable people, and in the portion of my God, his inheritance, and my abode is in the full assembly of the saints. The Holy Gospel from St. Luke, chapter 11. At that time, as Jesus was speaking to the multitudes, a certain woman from the crowd, lifting up her voice, said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore thee, and and the paps that gave thee suck. But he said, Yea, rather, blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. On February 2nd, five seminarians in Our Lady of Mount Carmel Seminary in Boston, Kentucky received the cassock. Some of them will be brothers, some of them will be priests, God willing. And Bishop Williamson will come in June to confer the tonsure. And um, the brothers, of course, uh, will make vows, God willing. And uh, the seminarians continue their studies. What are they studying in this first year? They're studying, of course, sacred scripture. We're in the, uh, the great encyclicals defending the, the infallibility of the scriptures, that they're inspired by the Holy Ghost, every event, every word. The book of Genesis is not a fiction. The book of Genesis is, is history. And uh, the popes had to defend that and condemn the modernists who are attacking the Gen- book of Genesis. So they're still studying right now in the book of Genesis. Uh, They're also studying the encyclicals of the popes. They have done on Freemasonry with Father Chazal when he was visiting. And they they have studied the encyclical Merari Vos, which condemns a lot of the modern errors. Uh, Vatican II has been condemned repeatedly by all these great popes for the last 200 years. And so Vatican II is already condemned, and someday it'll be again condemned. And by their fruits, you know it. And uh, so they're studying these encyclicals. They also just finished Quanta Cura and the great syllabus of errors of Pius IX and Pope St. Pius X. These are crucial uh, and, and dynamic encyclicals and condemnations, which again... Um, stand totally opposed to the conciliar church. And that's why Archbishop Lefebvre said, we are fighting the same fight right now. We are in a major war. And our fight of traditional Catholics who want to keep the faith and not change it and modernize it and compromise it is uh, that it, it's, it's, it's the fight, he said, of the syllabus. The syllabus, he says, was sensational when it came out because so many liberals, it shocked them. It, uh, so, because, because so many Catholics were thinking, well, we've got to start thinking with the world. We've got to start adapting to modern democracy and we've got to start adapting separation of church and state. After all, in America, the church is blooming. There's vocation. The churches are being built. So... The system where the church is neutral on matters of religion must be the best. And the Pope said, no, no way. It is not the best. If the church flourishes, it's in spite of this system. But you must long and desire and work and pray and fight for the, a, a Catholic state, a Catholic government, where Christ is honored as king and his laws are in our constitution. 
and his one true religion, the Holy Roman Catholic Church, is in the Constitution and protected by the state. That's normal. But we're so modernized and we're so twisted, even us traditional Catholics, we're so liberal. Uh, Catholic, we're, we think it's shocking to hear these things still, when it's actually the most normal thing. And the goddess of liberty in the, st in the New York Harbor, for Catholics, our goal is, we don't want that false liberty that blinds out the truth. We want that with a facelift and a mechanical uh, uh, renovation to make it the Virgin Mary holding the child Jesus, holding up the, t the light of the true faith. That's what we Catholics want. So anyway, studying the syllabus of errors is, is exciting, and, um, and it's always good to go over these things for you, fathers of families, to keep your heads straight in this confusion. And, uh, the, and, and these papal encyclicals are powerful. Um, we also have seen, the, of course you're aware of this, um, Cardinal Ratzinger said, Vatican II, especially the, the document on Gaudium et Spes, the church in the modern world, that it is a, a complete um, anti-syllabus. He admitted it's completely opposed to the syllabus of Pope Pius IX. Now, when Pope Pius IX made the syllabus of errors, there's about 73 errors he condemned, 73 or 72, one by one, all the modern errors, bam, 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 bam. And... Uh, he said it's uh, what Cardinal Ratzinger said, and, uh, who was Pope Benedict XVI, he said that it's an anti-syllabus, this document of Vatican II, which means it's opposed to an infallible document of the, of the Church. Of course, he believes it and upholds it. But he announced, he says already right there, the condemnation of Vatican II although he fully believes in Vatican II. And now, uh, now the, our dear society St. Pius X is threatened by the leaders. The captain of the ship is, lead, ta is taking, taking the, the little lifeboat of the SSPX right into the glaciers, right into the rocks. And he's already got holes in it now. He's already signed the documents. He's already uh, come out with statements saying, for example, that by ritualism, the new Mass and the old Mass won't pose a great problem. And a lot of people didn't catch that. That's his 2001 interview. You, should, you must find that. It's quite shocking. And that's the interview where he says, well, we don't reject the Council. In fact, we accept 95% of it. So how can the leader of the ship be taking us right into the rocks? And that's why... Uh, if they want to go into the rocks, they can go, but we, we want to stay Catholic. We won't want to dis dissolve the Catholic truth. And we don't want to put the real Mass on an equal level with that blasphemous Mass, the new Mass. And the fruits of the new Mass, it's obvious. It makes Catholics, priests, especially priests and nuns, may lose their faith. And we don't want to dissolve Jesus Christ the King. St. John in his epistle says, who dissolves Jesus Christ the King does the work of the Antichrist. Vatican II dissolves Jesus Christ the King absolutely. Tears him out of the constitutions of states, tears him out of the public life, puts him on an equal level with Buddha and Muhammad and the Joseph Smith and all the false religions. But he's God. That's a blasphemy to do this. We don't dissolve Jesus Christ. We adore Jesus Christ. We love Jesus Christ. We want Him to reign over us because that's where the true peace is. And all the UN and, and all the United Nations lies and peace treaties are all false. They're all a joke. And the only real solution is our Lord Jesus Christ adored by all, including the political leaders. Go preach to all the nations, Christ said. He didn't go preach to the sacristies. Just go. He didn't say go preach to just to those, you know, the, you know, the few people who are interested. Preach to all nations. Bring them all to the faith. And that's why the Jesuits, their policy was when they came across tribes of Indians or uh, dynasties in Japan or China, they would go right to the leader. 
Because if you convert the leader, you convert everybody. So in 988, St. Vla Vladimir of Ukraine, the great king, when he converted, uh, he said, I want all my people to embrace the true faith with me. So in the year 988, all the priests were busy 24-7 baptizing in the river. So, so they're studying these great encyclicals, and now we're on uh, the, our, our apostolic mandate of St. Pius X, where he speaks about the one world government, one world religion. He speaks about, mod condemns modern democracy. He condemns the, eight, the philosophers of the 1700s, which are the foundation of modern politics, liberalism, and also the foundation of the modern philosophy, which is pure poison. So these philosophies and new theologies are what fill the heads of the last five popes and the modern bishops. And that's excluding the, the 10,000 or so infiltrators who, as they said in the 30s, since the priests won't become communists, the communists will become priests. And they infiltrated the church at Vatican II to tear her down from within. And all these scandals of the clergy and the, the horrible scandals against the virtue of purity, these are not a mistake. They are not a mistake. And the seminarian professors who are, who are infiltrators, they've turned away the good men. They turned them away and pulled in all these wet noodles. So, <clears throat> so pray for the young seminarians. They know they're in for a battle. They're, they're under... They're under no illusions. They're certainly not there for a Hilton Hotel. They haven't had water in the seminary for the past week. The pipes are frozen, and uh, they've been patiently dealing with that. These are minor crosses, though, compared to the major war we're in. But uh, it's good training, and uh, it's anything but elaborate, but the basics are there. So do pray for them, and pray for the... Pray for the American boys going into Winona. It's, it's a pity. It's very serious. It's very serious. Under the new direction of Winona, the, the rector there is fully imbued with this new direction of Bishop Fillet. He's totally for it. And the young seminarians are coming out favorable towards the council. Oh, you can't condemn it all. You can't be so narrow-minded. And you have to obey, you have to obey. And you can read a very recent letter done by the fathers of families in France. A very interesting, a great letter. It's really, and they, they're writing to Bishop Fillet. And they're basically saying, we have been duped and falsely led 50 years ago by the bishops. And it's not going to happen again. And please resign. You've already done enough damage, enough confusion, enough ambiguous language. To, to dissolve Jesus Christ. It shows you don't want the kingship of Christ. You've already proved your cards. Please resign. You've done enough damage. And take out all the liberals with you, including Father Fluger. In one of his talks, he mocks Bishop Williamson. He makes a mockery of the resistance. He makes a mockery of, of uh, the, any opposition to Vatican II. You have to read that as well. Don't listen to me, just read his own words. He condemns Menzingen by his own words. And he's the first assistant. And he's leading, they're leading the, the ship right into the rocks, along with Pope Francis. And, and now there's recent talk of the resurgence of the, of the agreement coming back. Uh, the, the agreement is already in. It's already in the bloodstream. The poison's in. And the agreement... If it takes place, it'll be a big blessing because then the lines are drawn. And certainly for the priests, it'll be a blessing because they can't sit on the fence anymore. It'll be clear. So pray for the priests that they have the courage to defend who were ordained to fight for, our Lord Jesus Christ, the King, and the true Catholic faith of all time. And there should be no question about, on this, no second thoughts on this, no deliberation on, on the truth. So pray, pray, and uh, pray for 
all these, uh, these good vocations that are there in this country and throughout the world, they are there. It's a miracle. <laughs> Every vocation is a miracle in this modern world, says the Archbishop said that, you know, 15, 20 years ago, but uh, 25 years ago. But today it's even more so. So, um, anyway, do pray for those seminarians and uh, they truck along. Uh, yesterday we, uh, on Friday afternoons, they have free time. So yesterday, sometimes we take them out to see the Holy Land of Kentucky, all the, the, the old monasteries, convents, and cemeteries. And it really was a Holy Land. There really was a, a Catholic foundations all over the place. And um, so I took them to the convent of Loreto, where the nuns there in the 1800s, it was those nuns, a group of them from that foundation under Father Nierinx from Belgium. Uh, this group of nuns in horse and wagon traveled all the way from Loreto, Kentucky, all the way to Santa Fe, New Mexico. And that's where they took over the school. The bishop was calling for nuns to come and teach. They came and taught. And it's those nuns that didn't have a staircase to the, to the uh, choir loft. And they made a novena to St. Joseph. And on the ninth day, this old man appeared at the door. He said, I'm here to build the staircase. And he was there in and out, very quietly, unnoticeable. He was working for a couple, three weeks or so, or maybe months. And the nuns intended to pay him after. And, and then they couldn't find him. And they went to the lumber yards, to the hardware stores, to the nail shop. Have you seen this man? He's about so high. He has a beard and never has, never saw him, never saw him. And, uh, well, it's, it's, it's truly believable that it was St. Joseph. Why? Because two things. The staircase is so built that there's no center pole. There's not a nail built into it. And by the laws of physics, really, it should collapse. Um, and then the other more astounding thing, arborologists have studied it. They cannot identify what wood on earth it's made from. They don't know. So it's a, it's a grace for this country. And not far from Santa Fe, about an hour south on the highway, you have the Kurai ruins which in 1630s, around that time when the Franciscans were just coming there, 200 years before the Loreto nuns, uh, Venerable Mary of Agreda was bilocating from Spain. She was teaching the Indians the catechism. And uh, so when the Franciscans actually came, they discovered, how do you know about the seven sacraments? How do you know about extreme unction? How do you know about the sign of the cross and mass they said, well, a lady dressed in blue, she comes to teach us. She's been coming for 12 years. She comes, she disappears. So the superior, Father Bonaventura of the Franciscans, the provincial, he had to find out who is this woman. And he researched, and he went back to Spain. He found the convent where she was. He found her, Mary of Agreda. And when he talked to her, she never left her convent, but he discovered she knew all the Indians' names. She knew their customs. She knew their food, how they dressed, all their ways. So he was stunned at the mercy of God. And this, this is in our own country. So anyway, they went to the Loreto nuns, of course. They saw the, uh, the first altar, Father Nerinx, brought from Belgium, full of relics of saints. And uh, Father Baden, he was another one who didn't like the liberalism of Father Carroll, Bishop Carroll in Baltimore. So he fled, he took off to the Wild West, then of Kentucky, started the first seminary. He was the first ordained priest in the United States, to be ordained in the United States. And um, he started the seminary with five seminarians. And those five seminarians became bishops for the West. And... Um, Anyway, of course, the convent now, the chapel is gutted. All the nuns are, they told us, we love Vatican II. 
<laughs> we're all in for it. And I told them Vatican II was the worst disaster in the history of the church. And they say, well, different strokes for different folks. If that's what you think, that's fine. But they're all for Vatican II walking around in their blue jeans, blouses. But there was only one old Loretto nun. She's, she's turning 90 soon. She wears the full habit. And uh, she keeps her rosary. So anyway, the wonderful fruits of Vatican II, it's right before their eyes. Emptied out church. You can't even find the Blessed Sacrament a table, and uh, an organ, that's about it. So these nuns, uh, any new vocations? No, they're all over, their, well, they're all over 65. So uh, where's their future? In 20 years that place will be sold, as so many convents have been, and monasteries and seminaries. So <coughs> Vatican II speaks for itself. So why is Bishop Fillet playing these games I can't explain it. I don't know. All I can say is pray for him. Uh, I hope it's goodwill. He certainly has been warned by Bishop Tissier. He's warned by all his priests. Don't go this direction. And uh, Bishop Williamson gave him many warnings. But instead of listening to the wiser and senior bishop, because he was chosen before Bishop Fillet, he kicked him out. And that's how he handles any opposition. He expels them, silences them, transfers them. And, uh, the, and it's lamentable, it's sad, it's unbelievable this is happening. A lot of priests and faithful don't want to hear it. They don't want to believe it. How can someone so nice do this? I can't explain how someone so nice as Bishop Fillet can, can uh, condemn priests, expel a bishop, mistreat priests, put them out to the streets. I don't know why but it's happening, and uh, that's not so much the worry as the, the new direction dissolving Christ the King. That's, that's, what's, that's the problem. That's the big problem. People have always suffered from superiors. St. Teresa did, St. Bernadette did. That's, that's normal. But when they change the faith or play with the faith, then you're in a, a different battlefield. And when they want to talk obedience, in obedience, in obedience, we have to say to Bishop Fillet what we've been saying to Pope, the popes of Vatican II. We acknowledge your authority, we pray for you, but we cannot follow you in this direction. If you demand of us obedience going towards Vatican II and the new Mass, goodbye. We are first obedience, as St. Peter and Paul said, is to God and to the faith of all time. So anyway, so much for the announcements. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, the people, uh, the priests of the resistance get a little long-winded. But there's a lot of wind out there blowing. But uh, people will pay big money to watch a four-hour football game or a hockey game or the Olympics or a living room sports game or movie uh, so, uh, you know, it's, to have a little longer sermon doesn't hurt. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. In the Holy Mass, right after the consecration of the Mass, what happens? You see the priest genuflect to adore the precious blood. The third genuflection our Lord is on the altar. Golgotha, Calvary has been reenacted. The Virgin Mary is standing next to the priest. Millions of angels surround and adore him. The devils flee and howl and blaspheme. And then the priest starts the prayer in silence called the Unde et Memores. You see it in your missal. And it, refer, it brings up the passion, the death and the resurrection of Christ in his glorious ascension. And then you see the priest will make five signs of the cross over the oblation. Now, in the transitional masses, they started to drop these in the 1965, 66, 67. You can find old missiles where priests actually took a pen and crossed it all out. But why are those five crosses? Is it blessing? No, because God is there. 
So the priest says, St. Thomas Aquinas, quoting the fathers of the church, all the crosses have a meaning in the Mass. Every bow, every genuflection. That's why St. Teresa of Avila said, I would give my life for one rubric of the Mass. Because every single motion laid down by the, the wisdom of the Holy Ghost inspiring the Catholic Church in her sacred Mass, every movement, there's a meaning to it. And as you know, St. Padre Pio at Mass, he would bleed, he would see the Passion, he would go through the Passion. So his Mass would last sometimes three hours. <coughs> so just in this one prayer, why the five signs of the cross? St. Thomas Aquinas says, because the priest is pointing out the five bloody wounds of our Lord on the altar. Because he's sacrificed on the altar. He's, he's living there. He's living in his sacrifice on the altar. The sacred heart of Jesus pierced through his hands, his feet. And that sublime prayer is, is the most beautiful and most powerful prayer. That's the only prayer God the Father is interested in, in fact, is His Divine Son, sacrifice out of love. Love for God the Father, to pay for our, our sins, and it's the most perfect act of love of neighbor. Greater love than this no man has than to lay down his life for his friends. At every Mass, that reality is present. And that's why we're on our knees. That's why we adore that's why the Mass begins with an act of humility and not with good morning folks. So the five signs of the cross point out the five wounds in that part of the Mass. And then the next prayer refers to three great figures of the Old Testament. And these figures offered sacrifice. And their sacrifice, like everything else in the Old Testament, points directly to Jesus Christ. Everything in the Old Testament points to Christ. As St. Augustine says, the New Testament is the shadow. Excuse me. The Old Testament is the shadow. The New Testament is the reality. The Old Testament is the antitype. The New Testament is the type. The Old Testament is the finger pointing the New Testament is Christ in His glory, in His passion, in His death, in His resurrection. So you have the three figures. The, firstly, the sacrifice of Abel. And the book of Genesis says, Abel was, obviously him, him and Cain were the first sons of Adam and Eve. And Abel offered, he was the pastor ovium. He, was a, he tended to the sheep. And Cain tended to, he was a farmer. And, he ha and uh, it's clear from scriptures, Abel offered his best lamb to God. And he would kill it as a sacrifice to God. His best lamb, the, the, the best meat, the best color, the healthiest lamb. While Cain, Cain offered his fruits, but it wasn't the best fruits. It was, you know, the ones that, you know, bruised and these guys are a little discolored. He would give second best to God. And that's why God would show his pleasure by flame, by fire, by consuming the sacrifice of Abel. But he didn't regard the sacrifice of Cain because Cain didn't give his best out of love for God and adoration. So when Cain, so Abel was killed by his brother out of jealousy. And this prefigures Christ who will not offer a lamb, but he will be the lamb. That St. Saint, Saint John the Baptist will point out, Etchianu's day, there's the Lamb of God. And so St. Peter and St. James and John followed him. They, he pointed it out directly, the prophet to actually point the Redeemer physically. And that's why at Mass the priest also says, Etchianu's day, he holds the living God, the Lamb of God, sacrificed on the altar. So Abel is a historic figure. He really existed. He really was killed by Cain. But God also writes the poem of history to point to His Divine Son. All history is like a song for His Divine Son, to glorify His Divine Son. So Abel sacrifices the lamb. He's killed by his brother, as Christ will be killed by his brothers, the synagogue of Satan. 
the Jews will kill him. And he'll be betrayed by one of his own bishops, uh, Judas. So the sacrifice of Abel is brought up. Also the sacrifice of Abraham. Abraham was told by God, go take your son Isaac. Now, think about this. Abraham was in his ni- was 100 years old. Sarah was 90, in her 90s when she conceived Isaac. And Abraham was promised by God, you will have a son. And I will multiply your children like the stars of the sky. And out of you, of course, will come the Redeemer down the line. So Abraham, you know, think about it. If we think this crisis is long and this battle for the faith gets long and weary, well, just look at the, some of the saints. And one of them is St. Abraham. He's 30 years old, waiting for his son. He's promised. No son. He turns 40. Sarah's 40. No son. Well, they get beyond the childbearing years. They're in their 50s now. And Sarah's saying, well, we're beyond childbearing years. But Abraham says, no, God promised us the son. They turn 60, 70, 80. And by this time, Sarah's just, you know, this is not going to happen. That's why she laughed when the three angels came and told Abraham, you're going to have a son. And she heard this outside the tent, and she laughed. So that's why she named Isaac Isaac which means laughter, because she laughed at the thought that she's 90 and she's going to have a child. But she did. God kept the promise. And so how they loved Isaac, their only son, they loved him, you know, their whole life, everything was for, waiting for him. And then God asked the impossible, humanly impossible, take your son, at this age maybe was 12, 14, 15, I don't know, take your son to the mountain and sacrifice your son to me And the scripture uses the words that St. John will say, take your only begotten son and sacrifice him to me. And so Abraham, you know the story. Abraham's about to... Firstly, Isaac carries the wood for the altar up the mountain. As Christ will carry the wood of the altar of the cross up the mountain. And then Isaac is tied down to the altar. After he builds the altar of wood, he's tied down on it. And before that, Isaac asked his father, you got everything for the sacrifice, well, where's the the animal for the sacrifice? And Abraham said, well, God will provide, my son. Well, he tied him down to the altar, and and, uh, Abraham's probably in a cold sweat, shaking, because this is the last thing his, his heart wants to do, but he wants to obey God. And he draws a knife to strike his son, and the angel stops him. Abraham, Abraham, don't strike your son. God has received your sacrifice. So Abraham was spared. But God the Father did not spare his only begotten son for us. And Abraham, as Isaac on the the wood of the altar of of the sacrifice, prefigures Christ on the wood of the altar of the cross on Mount Calvary. But he wasn't spared. He was butchered butchered for us. And it's three o'clock when he died. That's the same hour in the, the temple that the high priests were striking the lamb with the, the knife to sacrifice it. Three o'clock. And that's when the earthquake shook and put an end to the Jewish religion because the real lamb now was sacrificed. And then the dead even rose and walked through the streets telling the Jews, you just killed the God. You just committed a deicide. And that night, scientists have found, that night of Good Friday, the moon came up in a bloody red. And there's supposed to be four blood moons this coming year, which is very unusual. Uh, So Abraham is prefigured. Abraham offers his son, Abel the the lamb, Abraham his son, and then Melchizedek. Melchizedek is an interesting figure because, as you know, if you read the scriptures, The Jews always record the genealogy of the fathers. And you see that for the epistle for the Mass of the Virgin Mary. All the lineage to St. Joachim and then Joseph, her husband. 
But with Melchizedek, he's an interesting figure because there's no lineage. He just, he just pops out of nowhere in the book of Genesis. He, there's no lineage of where, who his father was or his grandfather, which is unlike the Jews. He's a priest. He's higher than Abraham because Abraham pays tithes to him for the sacrifice. And what is the sacrifice? Is it an animal? Is it bloody? What is the sacrifice of Melchizedek? And St. Paul is going to say, you are a priest, speaking to Christ. You are a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So what is the sacrifice of Melchizedek? He offers something very strange in the history of sacrifices. He offers bread and wine. That's his sacrifice. Bread and wine. So his lineage is not known. He offers bread and wine, and it's a real sacrifice offered to God. And the fathers of the church tell us, and this is why Mother Church puts it right here in the Mass, that it prefigures the clean oblation that will be offered everywhere, all over the world, where the true Mass is offered. And that sacrifice is the body and blood of Christ, separated to show the death of Christ. The body and the blood separated is a dead person. So Christ shows his sacrifice to the Father by the consecration, separate consecration of the host and the precious blood. And then the non-lineage of Melchizedek shows that Christ, he prefigures Christ, that Christ will come from eternity. His, his lineage in his divinity will be from eternity, not known to man. And that's why Melchizedek's genealogy is not recorded, because Christ was from above. As he told the Jews, I am from above, but you are from below, you're, and you're from your father, the devil. So, uh, this, all, all these Old Testament sacrifices, these three in particular, of course, Noah will offer one, and down the history, all the Levites of the Old Testament, but these three are mentioned because they're particular to foretelling the real sacrifice that takes place on the Mass, in the Mass. So, um, that's why the Mass really is the heart of the Church, but the Mass is built on the faith, even. If, if next time I come, I say, I accept the new Mass, and I accept Vatican II, you better walk out of here. And if any priest signs anything accepting Vatican II and the new Mass, you better walk out and don't go to their Mass. Why? Because they're lo they've lost their faith. And that's why in Hungary, and in Ukraine, and in England, and in France, and in Mexico, all those priests offered the traditional Latin Mass. There was no other Mass for the Latin Rite. But those people did not go to those priests' Mass who, who took the oath to the state religion or who promised they would not speak out against communism, like the Pax priests in Hungary. The Catholic people did not go to their Mass. Why? Because they compromised the faith. That's why you can't go to a an Orthodox Mass, a Byzantine Mass of the Orthodox, because they don't have the faith, the full faith, because they deny the primacy of Peter of Rome, they deny the, 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 that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son. But their Mass is beautiful, their Mass is ancient, it's a proof against the modernists that very early the Mass was elaborate with uh, a distinct language and ceremonies and incense and it's beautiful and chants. But a Catholic cannot go to those masses because they don't hold the whole faith of, that God has revealed. And that's why the Catholic Church always prayed for the conversion of the, ortho, of the Orthodox. But that shows the mass is built on the faith. And that's why the faith is so important. And that's why we are in this position. Uh, let me close with the great words of Archbishop Lefebvre himself. This is a conference um, in December the 21st, 1984, speaking to the future priests, the seminarians and priests that were there. He says, now this 
is, uh, you can find this quote in the book, The Impossible Reconciliation. All of you should read this. It's a good compilation of, of what's going on. And uh, he's talking, this priest brings it up because Father Pfluger said that those who, um, those who resist, basically, an agreement with Rome have a, have a Protestant view of the church, he says. And we, he says, we have an obligation, we are obliged to overcome our abnormal canonical status. Now, this is from Menzing in saying this, that we, we're in an abnormal situation, we're outside the church, we've got to get back in. Did Archbishop Lefebvre ever speak this way? He said, we're not outside the church. Do any of you deny your catechism? Any of you change the Mass? Any of you accept Vatican II? No, that's why we're traditional Catholic. We don't want the conciliar church. We want to stay Catholic. As a, a, a great Catholic writer in Corsao in Brazil, he said years ago there would be several, church, several popes over one church. Two or three popes, anti-popes. But now, he said, we got one pope over two churches, the Catholic and the conciliar, and we reject the conciliar. We want to stay Catholic. But Father Pfluger and Menzingen now, they see us as outside the church, and we got to get back in. And that's why he says, it's an obligation to overcome our abnormal canonical status. And that's why that Rosary Crusade and the Second Intention going on now, uh, speaks about tradition coming back in, in, uh, to the, inside the church, which is very ambiguous, but basically means the SSPX got to come back inside the church, come under Rome, come under this pope. Now listen to Archbishop Lefebvre, listen to his clarity, and uh, they, they often accuse the resistance priests, oh, you take Archbishop Lefebvre out of context. You only read one side of him, but actually he did want an agreement. Well, no. No, listen to his own words. What matters to us first and foremost is to maintain the Catholic faith. That's what we are fighting for. So the canonical issue, this purely public and exterior issue in the church, that's to be canonically recognized, is secondary. What matters is to stay within the church, inside the church. In other words, in the Catholic faith of all time, in the true priesthood, in the true mass, in the true sacraments, and the same catechism with the same Bible, because they invented the ecumenical Bible, as you know. That's what matters to us. That's what the church is. Public recognition is a secondary issue. Thus, we should not seek what is secondary by losing what is primary, by losing what is the primary goal of our fight. For example, there was the case of Father Cantoni. Father Cantoni disappeared. He left with his seminarian friends because he preferred to be publicly, officially, in good standing with modernist Rome and to withdraw from the fight for the faith, to be silent about the new Mass, to be silent about all the errors currently running through the church, all the liberal errors. That we cannot do. We cannot accept this situation. We must be firm, very firm. So does Archbishop think we're Protestant mentality to not want to go back to that conciliar church? Of course not. But now this is the disease of liberalism that has effect, infected within the society ranks of the priests, and it's, it, and it's trickling down, and it's very lamentable, because the priests are all about talking now, and they're, they're getting filled with this at the priest retreats, and in Winona, they hear all about, you gotta obey, you gotta obey, you gotta obey. Well, remember what happened 45, 50 years ago, and when the new mass came out? Many good, conservative, obedient, holy priests they obeyed. They obeyed all right, and they led their flocks right to the jaws of death, right into the jaws of losing their faith, right into the jaws of changing the Mass and the sacraments. 
So obedience is first to God. Archbishop Lefebvre understood this clearly. He, there was no, more, no man more obedient than him. And we want to obey the Pope, but we can't obey this Pope when he's modernist and commands modernist things. We can't obey now Bishop Fillet with all his desire to go make an agreement with Rome and all his ambiguous language. And I repeat, he's like a Paul. We're living a repeat, as Bishop Williamson says, of Vatican II, but on a smaller scale. And Bishop Fillet is acting very similar to Pope Paul VI. Pope Paul VI said many traditional things. He even wrote a Humane Vitae, condemning contraception, which was a good thing. But same Pope, same face, same mouth, Catholic doctrine, but same mouth, modernist doctrine. He would sign, uh, he signed the document, document on religious liberty, which, which uh, made all the resisting bishops side with the Pope because he said there's nothing traditional against tradition in this document. But he didn't change anything in it. So he played games like this also and punished severely the traditional clergy. And of course, he suspended Archbishop Lefebvre, just like Bishop Fillet expelled Bishop Williamson. The liberal becomes a tyrant. Or as Archbishop Lefebvre said, there's mo no one more sectarian than a liberal. So. I don't enjoy saying these things, and I, I don't enjoy talking about them, but we're in war, and we've got to know the enemies. And if the enemy has uh, Episcopal robes, but he's acting like an enemy, well, we've got to shout out, there's a wolf. Sorry, there's a wolf, though. And we must not compromise the faith. As Archbishop, you just heard Archbishop Lefebvre say, we cannot put second things first. The first thing is keep the faith of all time. And you little children, um, you're in for a big war. You're in for a fight. Our Lord wants you in these days to be the saints of these days. To be the great saints that will love our Lord till death. We are entering the age of martyrdom again. And uh, <clears throat> Satan has his hour. And he thinks he's going to win, but he won't, have, he, he won't have the final victory. We know the Virgin Mary will crush his head with her beautiful foot. And he'll be squealing, and his brains will be dashed out, and his teeth crushed, and he will lick the dust. He will eat the dirt. So let's pray to the Mother of God to, to quicken her victory. And let's pray to, to our Lord Jesus Christ, prefigured by the sacrifice of Abel, Melchizedek, and Abraham, that we love Jesus crucified, and that we stay faithful like they did, all the saints, and that we keep the faith of all time. Where do you find the faith of all time? Tradition. The infallible encyclicals of all the popes before Vatican II. That's where you find it, in the sacred liturgy. The canon, the, the, the councils of the church, Vatican I and all the previous ones, <clears throat> all the good encyclicals of the popes, and um, all the writings of the saints and doctors. That's where we find tradition. It's there. So hold fast, little flock, as St. Athanasius used to say, hold fast, little flock. They have the churches, we have the faith. But don't change the faith and grow in it and spread it. It's a fire that is uncontainable and it will be victorious again. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Amen.